Hello, authors. I am Melody Ann, founder of North Author Nation and your host today. Author Nation is a YouTube channel and it is a community of authors just like you, people who want to be successful nonfiction authors. So if you would like the support and resources that we offer, join us. You can see scrolling below your join Author Nation. That is the URL, authornationtube.com slash join. I look forward to seeing you there. Now, today we are talking about burnout. Most of us, at least once in our life, feel or are burnt out. So how do we become burnout proof? And how, do, as authors, do we deal with adding a book project to our lives and still live well? That is what we are going to be talking about today. Our guest, Janice Litvin, is on a mission to help leaders and teams banish burnout in their organizations so they can come to work healthy, happy, and ready to work. She does this through keynote speeches, workshops, and accountability, and of course, her book, and which is what we'll talk about today. She is president-elect of the National Speakers Association, Northern California chapter, recertification provider for SHRM, that is the Society of Human Resource Management, and WELCOA, Wellness Council of America. Please welcome Janice. Hello, Janice. Hello, Melody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. I, I I love that you're here. And I, you know, when I was doing a little research about you before we were here on the show, kind of coming up with what we wanted to talk about, I noticed one thing about you, and it just I have this confession to make. You are a Zumba teacher, and I am the Zumba student who stands, you know that Zumba student who stands in the corner going, Yes. <laughs> what are we doing? That's me. <laughs> I am for some reason i'm just not the best zumba student in the world and 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 actually most um group fitness i always just feel lost so you know i'm like i'm not going to come to any of your zumba classes unfortunately but i'm thrilled you're here to talk about burnout because this is something that authors deal with a great deal because throwing a book project into your life is like throwing in you know a second or a third or a fourth full-time job and so that's what i want to talk about today uh, and I wonder, do you have a, a bur like a personal burnout story that brought you to where you are today? How much time do you have? Yeah. <laughs> I have a lifetime of burnout, but I I'm kidding, of course. <clears throat> so as a technology person, I, I was a software developer. Then I did tech training. I did tech recruiting, which was a kind of a pressure cooker job and did that for 20 years. And then we came to the recession of 08. I had to find something else to do. And so I went to the gym and that's where I found Zumba, which of course is a stress reducer, but still it was a pressure cooker time because uh, a lot of people were out of work and there wasn't very much work. But then I found the world of workplace wellness and I devoted myself bringing together interests and passions I've had my whole life, which is physical activity, as you just noted, with Zumba and as a professional dancer in my past and uh, my love of working with people and my study of psychology and my own experiences overcome, overcoming my own stressors and burnout. I put it all together and created this thing called Banished Burnout. That's brilliant. I love it. And I just want to say that uh, we have Lizzie the Gifted listening who says, Janice Litvin is my favorite author because... <laughs> He says, she is an inspiration. So I just want to let you know that there is somebody out there giving you love already. And if you're other people who are out there, feel free to comment or as we go along, ask questions. This is a really important topic. And if you are on the replay, just keep listening. We have a lot more to come. So Janice, you work with teams and organizations to, to deal with, um, to, to banish burnout. So can you tell me a little bit about what that looks like? Well, as you may or may not know, I mean, everyone knows that we are going through or have gone through the last two years. And in a couple of weeks, it'll be a, our, our two year anniversary as a world and a nation dealing with stress and burnout. Burnout was already on the rise to the tune of 66 percent of American workers approaching burnout. And now the numbers have skyrocketed up to 80 percent and more. And this hits almost every profession. You know, I just did a talk for a group of school business officials 
and teachers are burning out, doctors are burning out. Of course, doctors and nurses are on the front line, but burnout is everywhere. And so every it seems like everyone needs help with it. Yeah, that that's so true. And I just, yeah, the doctors and nurses are on the front line. And I, I I just want to give a shout out to the teachers who may not be considered frontline workers, but boy, dealing with like parents need people to be, you know, looking after their kids and teaching them. And what a complex and complicated situation, right? At it's that so moment. complicated. And I, I dug pretty deeply in preparation for that talk. And then I, I actually arrived early so I, I could get to know what some of their stressors are. Not only are teachers trying to protect the children, but a lot of parents don't want their children to wear masks. Yeah. And it's up to the schools to keep the children safe and protected not to mention learning. On top of that, many teachers have quit. So the teachers who are remaining are dealing with picking up the slack, giving up their prep time and their lunch time to go fill in for a class. So then they have to stay up late working. Then they wanna take Fridays off and the school districts are having a hard time filling the Friday hole with subs. And so they're having to use a lot of creative energy to find subs and to inspire people to want to come to work. Can you imagine a teacher yeah. trying to teach in a hybrid classroom where they have 20 or maybe 30 students in the classroom and then a number on Zoom? So they have to talk to the camera and talk to the kids all without any assistance. And sadly, we really, really, really underpay our teachers in this country. Yeah, I, I can't, I honestly, I can't imagine. I, I can't, I can't imagine. But that, that brings me to, um, there must have been like this aha moment or this, this, you know, the 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 camel that broke the, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back moment for you, where you said, "That's it, I'm writing a book about this." Okay, okay. well, uh, your visitor, Lizzie the Gifted, who yes. I'm proud to call my favorite rapper. He's my son, who not only is a rapper but is a social media expert for the real estate industry. He was my social media guru and still is. And a couple of years ago, we were sitting talking, almost three years ago now, and we were sitting talking. I had been doing this talk called Banish Burnout for about a year or so, and I had already started a book about workplace wellness. And it was called Well Work Days or Working Well or something like that, but it wasn't getting done. And it wasn't getting done. And I even had a coach who was my developmental editor. And I was writing, but very slowly. So one day he and I are sitting talking. He said, Mom, why aren't you writing a book called Banish Burnout? I said, excuse me, the meeting's over. I ran into my home office, picked up the phone, called my editor and said, guess what? We're scrapping the first project. We're writing a book called Banish Burnout. And it was loosely based on my talk, Banish Burnout. Of course, I did a huge amount of research and pulled out more stories to embellish each chapter. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Aren't kids awesome? <laughs> Awesome. I don't know about anybody else's. <laughs> okay, my kids, your kids. I don't know. Okay, yes, absolutely awesome. Um, and so you you had this you had this this moment, right? Um, and in your research, I'm sure you uncovered much more than even you were thinking. And I'm, I guess my question is, I have two. What is burnout costing us personally? Kind of on that personal family you know, happiness level? And what is it costing us as a nation? Like you think economically, what is it costing us? Could you touch on both of those? I'll start with the second one. That's the easier question to answer. <clears throat> According to some statistics, uh, burnout is costing America 150 to 190 billion with a B dollars in annual healthcare spend. So not only are and the companies are picking up the slack because most workers are supported by their corporate health insurance system. Yeah. So not only is it costing them dollars in burnout health care, but workers are tired emotionally, physically, mentally. They're taking more time off, time off. When they come to work, they're there, but they might not be as sharp as they normally would be. And then sometimes they're complaining or they're just, they're just not as creative. We want people to be 
working as a finely tuned organism to be as just as creative and productive as they can be without working them to death, of course, but they just don't have that sharp creativity. And then they take their stress from work and bring it home or take their stress from home and bring it to work, whether they're working remotely or in person, and they're snapping at their family. They have less patience for their kids. And as you know, over the last two years, everybody was working at home together, kids and families. Suddenly parents were becoming homeschooling parents while they were trying to work. And in general, managers were a little more sensitive to that, but still the work had to get done. So mothers in particular were working until midnight because they'd stop in the middle of the day, especially the younger children, get them set up on their Zoom screens, help them with their homework. And, and nobody could uh, babysit each other's kids because everybody was quarantined. Nobody could do group uh, sports games because everybody was quarantined. So you also had to make sure your child was getting exercise. And it was you and your children, and that was it. And so mothers in particular were going back to work after dinner every night, working till midnight. And so they in particular got very burned out. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. I think mothers really took a brunt a uh, big hit when when COVID happened. Uh, I I do corporate storytelling, so I go into corporations and and help people tell stories, often personal stories, just to you know bond, especially during this time when we're all remote. And I remember this one story I coached a woman to tell. She was because she, she was working with a company that was really really good, which is often companies who bring in storytellers or you know forward thinking. <laughs> I have to say. Um, and she had this story of, you know, she was this mom and and her children kept like running in for things. And she was in this meeting. The CEO was there, like was this, you know, the executive suite was there. She had to present this thing and this kid ran in and she was horrified, just horrified. She's like, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. And the, the you know, the most important man in the room said, give me a moment, walked out, found his baby, brought the baby in held his baby in his arms and said, we all have families. We're all doing the same thing. Give her a hug, give her whatever she needs, and then we'll continue. I still, even now, I'm like, oh, because it was it was just one of those moments where there was this organization that was just bringing home, you know, into the office in a way that it was sustainable and non-judgmental. And she just, she just gushes. She loves working for the company she works for because of stories like this, right? I mean, I'm, I'm imagining your book has stories like this or or the opposite, stories where burnout is happening, right? So can you tell us a little bit more about the book? Well, I have so many responses to that story. First, first I'd like to say that that story is so beautiful and brings up a big point that I've been thinking about lately, and then I'll answer your question about the book. So it's one thing to offer... And, and by the way, I love the support that that woman got and kudos to her manager or her executive for acknowledging what she was feeling. It always surprises me to hear that there are companies out there and leaders and executives who are not as emotionally intelligent and as attuned as that particular manager. For example, expecting employees to answer the phone on Sundays or respond to emails quickly on Sundays is not acceptable. There is a lot of scientific evidence that shows the, the purpose and the value of giving people breaks, which means two days on the weekend. Of course, once in a while, if there's an emergency and you have to call the person in, fine, but it shouldn't be every Sunday. Here's another really quick vignette. I, as I told you, I interview every company deeply to find out about their particular stressors. When I was doing a talk for a manufacturing company owned by a German conglomerate, one of the VPs in product management told me that someone had quit and she was not getting the budget to backfill that position. So not only was she overworking, but everyone on her team was overworking and really physically burning out. And I felt sad that she didn't have the strength or the support from human resources to push back and say, you're burning us out. You're not getting the best from us. Here's what we need to have happen. Yeah. So that those are particular issues that I, I want to communicate to leaders out there. The more you treat your people with respect and give them the emotional intelligence that you need, the more you will get in terms of productivity and creativity. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Thank you. So, and then, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry I went so long with that answer, but you asked no, me, good. I think you asked me how I came to write the book. Yeah, I asked you a little bit about the book. Just oh, give, us a, the give, give us give us a peek okay. into the book. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> a peek into the book. Mm -hmm. So the table of contents will show you that there are six key tools I cover. And this is a toolkit, which is a workbook mm -hmm. with, wor with a lot of room to work the tools. And at the link that is now showing on your screen, you can actually mm -hmm. purchase an editable PDF where you can actually work the book on your devices if you don't like hard copies. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people like to work on devices. And so the first tool is called Stop and Audit. And that represents building an awareness of what you're doing to yourself mentally and emotionally. For example, you're in a long line at Starbucks you're waiting to get some coffee and you, you thought at three o'clock in the afternoon, I'll just pop into Starbucks and grab a cup of coffee. But you get there and the line is really, really long. And it seems like every customer is taking forever and it looks like they have a skeletal staff because everyone knows with the great resignation, it's hard to find good workers. And so you're, you're kind of getting irritated. You're looking at your watch, you're huffing and puffing, you're checking your email on your phone and the line is still long and you're starting to get angry and irritated. And all these tapes start to play in your head. I can't believe this is taking so long. These people are so stupid. Why is every customer asking so many stupid questions? And you start to build up and all those negative thoughts have a physiological response to the body. The heart rate increases, you begin to sweat and knots in the stomach and all these physiological responses. And when you live with those conditions, you're actually wearing down your resources and your ability to perform at the highest, most creative, productive level. So that's chapter one. I won't go into so much detail with every yeah. chapter, but each chapter is a tool to help build a well awareness and change behavior. And my favorite chapter is chapter five, set healthy boundaries, because mm -hmm. all of us, myself included, need to remember how and when to push back when we can't or just not able to do something. Yeah. And, and I, I think that that, you know, the boundaries, I think that's a lifelong lesson and yeah. some of it is recognizing when to put in your boundaries, but there's, as the, you know, the, the example you gave of this woman who lost, you know, a position in her team and what that, what happened, there's also a, a support system around you. And then there's also a set of skills that you need, right? We need conflict resolution skills. We need to be unafraid to speak up. I remember when I was younger, the whole idea of like confronting a boss or confronting anyone was terrifying. I didn't have the skills on how to remain calm while dealing with confrontation. And so I think that, that I, and I'm assuming there may be some of that in, in the workbook as well, or in your talks, you yes. talk about the, the skills that you need. Yeah. Because there's, there's, you know, boundaries. There's, there's actually many moving parts to boundaries. <laughs> right. There are many moving parts to boundaries. And it's very hard to push back. And in my talks and in my book, there are actual scripts to teach people how to say no without saying no. Like, for example, a boss comes to you with an exciting new project, but you're already juggling so many projects. And they come and say, guess what? I'd love for you to start on this project Monday. It's Friday afternoon, whatever. It, let's start this project Monday. I want you to hear all about it. And you're about to explode <clears throat> because you have so many stressors, the kids, the projects, and, and you're already overloaded. What do you do? Do you start screaming at the boss and say, oh my God, are you crazy? I don't have time for that. Don't you know what I'm working on? Or you say something like, I would love to join you on this new project. It sounds so exciting. Which of my other projects would you like me to back burner? So that says, that's pushing back without being really negative and angry and feeling hurt and abused. It's a way to say, let's look at the whole picture, either get me more resources or change some of my deadlines. You choose Ms. or Mr. Boss. <laughs> Yes, great point. And Lizzie, the gift just does great points as well. I <laughs> just want to point that out. Um, and, and you said something about, you know, what do you do? Do you yell back at the boss? And what I find is, unfortunately, we never yell back at our boss. We go home and we often, yeah, yes. 
than yell at someone we love, right? <laughs> that's, that's such a good point. And during the earlier days of the pandemic, I'll never forget, I consider myself, you know, after having written this book and going to therapy myself years ago, I consider myself relatively not stressful or not stressed. And I, I feel like in general, I can handle stress. Although I'm human, everyone's human. It's normal to have a reaction. The question is how upset do you get and how long do you stay there? But on this one day of, it was probably three or four months into the pandemic and I was starting to feel the stress of not having time with my friends, face-to-face -face time. I mean, we did Zoom chats with family members. I'll never forget one Friday night, we had a dinner party and each chair at the table had a different device and all these people were talking all at once. Needless to say, it was a little crazy. It was fun, but it was crazy. But there were a lot of Zoom birthdays and Zoom events and Zoom holidays spent together, but there's nothing to replace having face-to-face -face with a good friend. And a best friend at work is a huge stress reliever. So my husband, I, I was doing, I was cleaning a pot. I had made myself some lunch. I was cleaning a pot. And my husband made some innocuous statement about something about the pot. And I started screaming, don't tell me how to wash the pots. And so suddenly I thought to myself, hmm, why did I snap? So it, it's normal human behavior to have a reaction when stress is building up. The trick is trying to stay aware. But obviously I went in a room and calmed myself down and thought about it and came out and said, I'm so sorry I yelled at you. That was uncalled for, please forgive me. But, um, the, but these kinds of things I think happen more often than we realize. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. And so if I pick up the Banish Burnout Toolkit and I go through it, PDF and fillable PDF, I fill it out and I work through it. Before I do that, I am stressed out. I might be yelling at my kids. I might be, you know, not penning, playing with my dog or I might be doing, you know, all these behaviors that I may, I probably am like, I feel like a terrible person. Right. Who am I afterwards? Who are you afterwards after yeah. you worked the book? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. Um, I had a, speaking about author burnout, I had a little hair pull with my editor because she said, you have to have a chapter about self-care. I said, no, I don't need a chapter about self-care. Everybody knows what self-care is. It's just a matter of finding the motivation. Now I get asked to talk about self-care more than I ever expected. And one thing I realized is that sometimes we forget what self-care is. Yes, it's healthy eating, getting enough sleep and getting enough exercise and meditating. It's all of those things, but it's even more. It's remembering to have fun and to build fun into little tiny moments throughout the day. For example, after this event, I'm going to be very happy, of course, because we've had a live event. And I'm going to think about the accomplishment of having been interviewed and, and uh, having talked to your listeners. And uh, later in the day, I might finish uh, a project on my desk, like to write a blog post, for example. I'm not going to just scratch it off my list, my power list or whatever it's called and say, okay, next item, I'm going to stop and I'm going to say, good job. You wrote a blog post. I mean, a lot of people can just write, 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 write. I have to think, I have to plan I have to write and then I have to go back and put structure on it. Then I have to get someone to edit it. And a lot goes in for me to write a blog post. Uh, it requires a lot of thought. And so I'm going to pat myself on the back and say, good job. You had a completion. The brain loves a completion. That's one thing. Another thing I referenced a couple of minutes ago is people need their friends. And we forget. We get all caught up in the busy, busy, busyness of life. So we have um, one family that we're very close to. We see them almost every weekend. It's really, really important to go out with friends, whether you take a walk with or without a mask, whether you're vaccinated or not, go outside and spend time with your friends and your family and have some fun time with your friends. It's really, really important. Yeah, I, I, want, to, I, I want to pick up on a point you made. You said... When you finish a blog post, you don't just scratch it off your list and keep going. This is authors listening, right? You're listening because this is one of the biggest things I, I, I find I'm talking to people about. They want to go from task to task to task to task. And, and if I say, well, why don't you stop and breathe and celebrate that? Oh, it's 
just a 500 word blog post. And <laughs> right. But I, I hear it all the time. It's just this. It's not a big deal. It's like I can't celebrate unless I've climbed an actual mountain every day. And and <laughs> so thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that, because that's so important. Um, and we have a comment from Liz Parton. And she says, at this point in my life, I have the luxury of more time, but I can catch myself pushing myself to meet goals that are actually that actually produce self-imposed stresses. Yes, then I put myself in time out to chill. Do you have any comments on that? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So that's part of the whole self-care and making, remembering to find the happy. Whether you have an Apple Watch and you have reminders to stand up or you go outside. And by the way, one of the most exciting things about self-care that's so easy to accomplish, and I know we're still kind of in winter in a lot of parts of the country, but even during the winter, if you can go outside, put on your heavy coat, if you can go outside, whether the sun, direct sunlight is shining or not, light and sunshine activate vitamin D the minute you go outside. So if you can spend 10 minutes outside, either walking, squatting, gardening, doing jumping jacks, or talking to one of your neighbors, being outside instantly releases happiness chemicals and impacts almost every function in the body physiologically is, is improved by spending that time outdoors and that includes your immune system yeah exactly um and brilliant and i'd love to just switch over now to talk about author burnout because i think that's a special kind of burnout <laughs> at least yeah. it is in my world well you know with our authors who are professionals they run businesses entrepreneurs they have jobs they have family there's so much going on and then they're they say to themselves and i'm going to do this crazy thing called write a book, publish a book, and promote a book. You know, promoting a book goes on forever, right? Right, right. So how do we, um, do you have advice for us authors? <laughs> oh my gosh, uh, there's so much to say. First of mm. all, be go easy on yourself. There's perfection. I think part of the problem is writers are probably, anybody who wants to write a book is probably a pretty darn good writer, yeah. grammatically and, and all of that. And so, let go of perfection, number one. Number mm -hmm. two, get help, especially if it's the first book. Get a developmental editor who knows your niche. And luckily, I found I belong to a writer's group in the San Francisco Bay Area called BEPA, little plug for BEPA. And um, there I found a developmental editor who understood health and medical writing and mm -hmm. editing and and plus importantly we got along well i really loved being with her i looked forward to our meetings even though i wasn't meeting all my deadlines on the first book that never got done but i really loved spending time with her we i went to her birthday party we became friends and and so you want to find somebody that you can connect with that's smart that understands your niche and so what i did when i started writing this book is i mapped out an outline loosely based on the speech that I was already doing called Banish Burnout. And then she said, she gave me ideas about where to embellish, where to add stories, how to name the characters in my stories, and different things about the layout of the book that you would never have thought of because you're a writer. And, and your knowledge, you're writing about something that you have knowledge about, and that's your expertise. Your expertise is not about book publication and book layout and book cover design let people help you. So I got help along the way and uh, including different little ins ideas for like little inset boxes and things to emphasize and what's important, the order of the book and how much deeper to go with research, all those questions. It's really important to get help and let go of perfection. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really good tip. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that ongoing thing called promotion. Something I noticed when I was looking at your website is that you do uh, like bulk sales. You'll sell, you know, a number of books to a corporation. And I think actually changing your mindset can be help you reduce stress. Uh, uh -huh. You can think about, you know, how can I do things um, 
you know, not one at a time, but how can I, how can I batch things? How can I create more out of the one thing? Can you talk a little bit about what you've done uh, to help you redu reduce stress in that area? Well, again, getting help. Uh, I mentioned my wonderful son, Lazy the Gifted, who's been popping in and out. He is a social media. He's brilliant with branding and marketing and ideas about social media. So I do count on him. He gives me ideas about my LinkedIn posts. And I, I don't like to add pressure to myself. Some people say, oh, you have to post on LinkedIn every day. You have to post on LinkedIn every week. I try to let go of that pressure because it's overwhelming, it gives me knots in my stomach, and I'm really trying not to live a stressor kind of life. Although, yes, mm -hmm. I'm visiting people on LinkedIn on and off all day long. I comment on other people's posts. I've actually created pretty good friendships. I have friends that I have never met in person because of social media. So the, all of that is wonderful. I support other people's posts. I send people messages, congratulations on your promotion. I do all those things on LinkedIn, but I try to take the pressure off of always having the perfect post. Mm -hmm. Now there are people one can hire to help guide you with uh, making posts, but I feel like my posts should be mine and not put in other people's words. So I like doing my own posts, but social media is one uh, interviews like this is big. Uh, they say to keep uh, your websites active and relevant that Google likes a lot of activity on the website itself. So I'm constantly updating my website with videos and my blogs and testimonials and all of that is there on the website. And what else am I doing? I'm pretty active in my associations. Uh, you mentioned NSA, SHRM, well, COA and BEPA. So I'm pretty active with my associations. Serving on the board is one way I like to give back and just getting my name out there um, through my social media, my website and helping other people. Yeah, this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that stress is par for the course. It's part of the human condition. And at times you're going to have more stress than other times when it overwhelms you and you yell at your husband because he mentioned something about a pot when you're washing dishes, take a time out, think about what's going on, redirect yourself, but that it is par for the course. And one thing you can do is you can look at all the areas of your life. Like you talked about, I'm not really a social media person. So I'm taking that off my plate. I'm not, I'm not forcing myself to be you know, a certain way in social media, but I'm also, but I am really good at, you know, supporting other people who are posting. And so that's something I can do. So it mm -hmm. sounds like what you're saying is take a look at all of the things you're doing as an author and understand that although you're going to feel stressed, you can figure out what you're good at and what you like doing that doesn't feel stressful and build on those strengths, find the things that you don't like to do that you feel are weaknesses and, and let them go. Does that, am I let saying? Let them go or hire, or hire them out. Uh, let them go or hire them out. Brilliant. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I think that's really good advice. Just, you know, a lot of times we feel we have to have our toes in all the pools and uh, you know, that, that just breaks feet, right? Cause you know, you remember, can't... remember um, there's such a thing as positive stress. Everybody hears the word stress and instantly they think of, Oh, that's negative. We've got to prevent burnout. Well, yes, that's true. But there's also something called positive stress for example, and this is a simplistic example, but it makes the point. You're the parent of a toddler. The toddler's running towards the street. You're at the park or whatever, and it's time to go home. And the toddler's running ahead. Almost every parent has gone through this where you're like, don't they know? They better not run in the street. Well, they don't know. It's like touching a hot stove you learn the lesson sometimes you have to learn a lesson from doing uh, of course you don't want your child running in the street so you're running after the child screaming and yelling and running as fast as you can that's a positive form of stress it's a protection and so stress was the the inherent qualities of stress is that it's a protector that fight flight or freeze that happens in the amygdala it's a protector and so sometimes i like to remind myself that stress isn't just negativity. There's a positive element to it. And when we're beginning to feel stressed, like when I snapped at my husband, that was one indicator. And there are many indicators, but when you're beginning to feel stressed or see the indicator, you want to remind yourself, now's the time to slow down, back off, 
like you said, take a take a selfie. <laughs> when I say a selfie, I mean a self-care selfie and take yeah. the time to calm down. Thank you, Peter Litvin, <laughs> for chiming in. <laughs> yes, Peter Litvin Music says, yes. <laughs> I just want to, and I, I have been that parent in the playground child runs and 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 afterwards you think to yourself i didn't know i could move that quickly right and that's what the stress <laughs> does right it, it allows you to suddenly have this great speed you didn't know you owned <laughs> i want to remind you and everyone that um and we all know we're supposed to exercise and mm -hmm. I, I like to remind people because i i recently since the gyms reopened and i was a little bit slow to get back to the gym for me personally my favorite form of fitness is in a gym, a group exercise class. I do teach Zumba twice a week, but it's not enough. And the American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity. That's five days a week. Basically, you should be moving. It's like brushing your teeth. You should be moving a little bit every day, whether it's 10 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. And so I recently rejoined a local gym and started attending fun Zumba classes and I found my favorite instructor and I'm making friends with people in the class. And again, having that social connection, it's not just about the fitness, it's about laughing, hearing fantastic music and making friends in the class that you look forward to seeing and high-fiving each other or chatting before class, whatever. And all of these elements of self-care are really important to shore you up during those very stressful times, like when a family member is sick or you have um, an extra workload you have to do. Yeah, community is a, a vital part of maintaining our stress levels, or or not getting allowing our stress to get over, you know overwhelmed by our stress. I should say. Thank you for that. That's really important. Um, so, are you working on a new project, or do you have a new book coming out? What what's I'm just what's going on in your life at the moment? Well, um, I'm preparing for a lot of uh, presentations that are on my calendar, uh, but there's always room for more. But in terms of a new book. You know, a book starts with thoughts. And so I'm ruminating in my head. And I think I alluded to this a little bit earlier. And that is, I want to encourage company leaders to create a banish burnout culture. What that means is, number one, training the managers in emotional intelligence. Most managers are, prom are promoted for technical skills, whether it's accounting, finance, law, or software. And so it's important to remember, a and the World Economic Forum backs this up, that emotional intelligence is the more important skill. Because if somebody doesn't have a way to connect with their team emotionally, then they need to learn how. Because workers are humans. We're not little machines that put widgets in a, on a factory line, we're human beings with feelings and needs and emotions. And we care about our work. We want to care about our work. We want to be inspired by our work. We want to have a bigger picture connection to our work and we want to feel valued and heard. And so it's really, really important to create an environment where people are feeling appreciated and heard and not abused. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's I, I what that will be. So the title will probably be Banish Burnout for Leaders or something like that. <laughs> right, right. Not Banish Leader Burnout, but, you know, no. banish, yes, you're right. You know, not that we don't want them. We do no, want no, them. No, I don't want burnout. the leaders to be burned out either. Of course not. No, no. <laughs> we do want them to banish burnout, but we want to give the leaders tools right. to help their teams banish burnout so they can do it right. for themselves and then, you know, spread the banish burnout culture throughout the organization. That's brilliant. And people can find you on LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn.com slash I N slash Janice Litvin, your name. Um, are there any other ways that people would uh, be able to find you that you'd like? Well, to on my website, which I think you have a link somewhere, JaniceLitvin.com. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm all over the place. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and all and Twitter. I'm all over the place. But I spend most of my life on LinkedIn when I am on social media or, okay. or in a Zumba class. <laughs> yes, we're in, Zoom, in a Zumba class. So find her in the Zumba class. And if you're not there, head over to LinkedIn and find Janice there. Janice, is there anything we missed chatting about today that you wanted to add before we sign off? 
Uh, I don't think so. I just um, want to remind people to stay aware of how they're feeling. Sometimes burnout creeps up. So in a recent presentation, someone asked a very interesting question. She said, I'm thinking about uh, managing my stress all the time. I try to eat right and sleep and all the things, self-care things we've talked about. But she said, how can I tell if I'm starting to burn out? It's kind of like, let's say you have a sore leg and you ignore it and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And suddenly you can't walk on that knee or whatever the problem is. It's the same with burnout. Pay attention to the micro clues, like the beginning to have trouble sleeping, having trouble eating, overeating or under eating. Uh, like I said, behaviors at home, little behaviors like snapping at family members and ask your family members, hey, if I start to get snappy, please let me know, hey, you're getting a little snappy, is everything okay? Remembering to check in with yourself on a daily basis, whether it's meditation, taking a walk by yourself, asking a family member, journaling, which is highly, highly valuable because you learn what's underneath the issues that might be bothering you. And also when something is bothering you at work or at home, don't let it fester because it will grow and then you'll explode. So try to deal with things at least alone. And then if you have to have a meeting with somebody, have a meeting with somebody, but try to stay aware of what's bothering you. Yeah. And and uh, plug into your happiness as well, like I talked about earlier. Yes, yes, yes. For me, that's the mountains on the weekend. Um, thank you for saying that. Uh, you know, it, it brings up a really important point that, you know, if I break my leg, I know it, it hurts, but it's really hard to, and I think this is something, and I don't know about the rest of the world, but something in North America, we've kind of stopped listening to ourselves. We don't know when we're hungry. We don't know when we're full. We don't know when we're tired. We don't know, right? Yes. It's, I, you've made a really good point. I've noticed that we we're no longer listening to our own bodies. We're not in our bodies listening. We are out there somewhere. And that's leading us to shop too much, drink too much, eat too much, um, take substances that aren't necessarily healthy or whatnot. So thank you for saying that, that we need to kind of tune back into our bodies. And there are lots of ways you can do that. That's a whole other talk. Janice, thank you so much for coming today. I really love talking to you. Such an important topic. Thank you so much for having me, Melody. You're the consummate interviewer. I really appreciate you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And if you're out there and you haven't subscribed to Author Nation yet, do so because we have a live interview every Thursday. We always have fun and we always offer you very good value. And oof, closing note, Lise Parton says, thank you, Janice. Lots of good points. And we'll leave you there. Thank you.